they are images we can barely comprehend. The fearsome force and brutality of the Atlantic hurricane and its North Pacific counterpart, the typhoon. Often born in the fall, these massive cyclonic storms are at the height of their power when they first hit land, obliterating everything in their path. As they move inland, their power gradually diminishes. But this makes them no less dangerous or deadly. And what begins on the southern shores of the United States often ends on the coast of its northern neighbor. Late August, 1900. Off the southeast coast of Newfoundland, schooners troll an area of the North Atlantic known as the Grand Banks, traditional fishing grounds since the 15th century. The most prolific grounds in Newfoundland were the Grand Banks, what's called the Newfoundland Banks. There were several little banks that make up the Grand Banks, like the St. Pierre Bank, very productive with cod. So that's why they would have gone to the Grand Banks. Most of the schooners are from the island itself, but some have sailed from as far away as France to share in the rich cod harvest. The larger banking vessels, they probably would have had 16 to 20, 22 crew. But these smaller Newfoundland vessels, they would have had somewhere between 6 to 12 crew. One of the smaller Newfoundland sailing ships on the Grand Banks is the Lilydale, captained by William Edgecombe from Catalina. He loves to see all of the Edgecombes were captains. All of his, his brothers were captains. They've fished all their lives. Captain Edgecombe and his crew keep a close eye on the skies, knowing that the weather can be extremely fickle this time of year. One of the great uh, weather factors in August and September in Newfoundland was the appearance of what they call the August gales. In that age, communication was very limited. And if a fisherman wanted uh, to know about the wind, it had to be from their own lore, their own knowledge of the weather by reading the sky or reading the barometric pressure. Fishing the Grand Banks is an isolated existence before the time of radio communication and navigation equipment. The Lilydale is hundreds of kilometers from shore in the open Atlantic, where rough seas and high winds are all in a day's work. The life of a fisherman involved a lot of hard work, and it often meant being away from home for extended periods of time. And this involved quite a bit of hardship for the people left at home. One of these people is William's wife, Rosanna, who waits back home in Catalina. He wasn't married that long, I suppose. I'd say maybe to four years. She had one son, Isaac William. He was two when his father went away. My grandmother was expecting her second child. Her biggest dream was to have their own home. And that's why they worked like they did. That dream, however, is in danger of being destroyed by something being born thousands of kilometers away. Off the west coast of Africa, under a blazing tropical sun, masses of heated air thick with moisture rise from the ocean. The rapid ascent creates wild, turbulent winds and clouds that boom with thunder. Although not yet a storm, it is the initial stages of a hurricane. The energy source for the hurricane is the warm water that uh, is underneath it, uh, in the tropics in, in particular. And they come across on uh, trade winds towards the Caribbean, and they strengthen as they get to the western part of the Atlantic Ocean. Within 72 hours, the disturbance has turned into a colossal corkscrew three kilometers high and 150 kilometers around. The hurricane was first seen on, uh, on a weather map out in the, uh, in the Atlantic heading towards uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. But it really got going when it got to Cuba. Then it headed towards uh, southern Florida. 
By September 5th, the storm has swollen in size, larger than the states of Georgia and Alabama combined. As it heads northward, it veers suddenly to the west, surging across the Gulf of Mexico, fueled further by hundreds of kilometers of warm, open water. The fledgling U.S. Weather Service in Washington telegraphs warnings of the impending storm. Weather services had, uh, had started around uh, 1870 in, uh, in North America, but basically all they had was weather observing stations. So they were really restricted to about a one-day forecast. They knew there was this hurricane somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, but they didn't know where. Although there was a warning out, there was no specific warning, so people probably weren't taking it very seriously. The hurricane is in fact headed straight for the port city of Galveston, perched on a tiny island off mainland Texas. The highest ground in the entire community is less than three meters above sea level. For years, residents have urged city government to build a concrete seawall to protect Galveston's coastline, but nothing has been done. For veteran meteorologist Isaac Klein, the city's vulnerability is a major concern. Visits to the beach tell him that rising ocean swells could mean the approach of a hurricane. Isaac Klein, the head of the, uh, the Weather Service office in Galveston, did try to warn people when he saw the, the water levels rising. But basically all he had was a telephone and the ability to go out onto the streets. So his capability to, to do a widespread warning of the community was very limited. Friday, September 7th, 1900. As the giant storm races towards Galveston, it finally makes front page news. But the storm is too far away to elicit any personal concern from the people in Niagara Falls, Ontario. At the Niagara Falls Waterworks, 47-year-old Edward Carter is thankful that he and his family live in an area where hurricanes are not a threat. Farther north, in the isolated waters off the coast of Newfoundland, the crews of island fishing schooners are unaware of the hurricane's advance on American shores to the south. One of those ships, the Goodwill, is getting ready to head back to Newfoundland, its hold brimming with a successful season's catch. Its skipper's name is etched on the knife he always carries with him, Captain John Carnell. The Goodwill was a typical Newfoundland schooner that would have been fishing, and uh, Captain John Carnell and his brother and three other crew were taking this vessel to St. John's. On the way, they planned to stop at their home port of Carmenville. The Carnell boys look forward to seeing their wives and families after being away for more than a month. As the Goodwill prepares for its journey home, its crew cannot know that their lives, along with those of Captain Edgecombe on the Lilydale, his wife Rosanna on the mainland, Galveston meteorologist Isaac Klein, and Niagara Falls pumper Edward Carter will be forever altered by the fury that is about to hit the Texas coastline. Saturday, September 8th, 1900. In the port city of Galveston, Texas, the day begins with a magnificent sunrise. But the bright blue sky soon gives way to a somber one, thick with rain. Over the Gulf of Mexico, gale force winds send a mammoth storm surge directly at the heart of the city. They recorded 100 miles an hour, uh, which is above the level needed for it to officially to be a, to be a hurricane. Uh, when it came ashore, it had this huge seven meter storm surge that came along with it. And that was enough to inundate the whole of downtown area of the city. It destroyed uh, thousands of homes, and not only homes, but the hospitals churches, the government institutions, the weather station itself, these were all washed away or destroyed. 
houses shattered by wind and water become battering rams that destroy other homes. Roof tiles whip through the air, slicing through flesh like deadly razors. By late afternoon, over six meters of water cover the city, and the level continues to rise. Families forced onto floating roofs and other debris watch loved ones swallowed one by one by the seething water. Even the man who saw the storm coming is not immune. When his own home breaks apart, Weather Bureau Chief Isaac Klein and his brother Joe pull their families to the floating roof. Before the night is over, Isaac Klein loses his wife to the dark, rising waters. Winds continue to batter Galveston for 15 straight hours as the eye of the storm moves past the western end of the island. In the very center of the hurricane, perhaps 20 or 40 kilometers wide, is a quiet area called the eye. But just outside that is the eye wall, and that's an area of severe thunderstorms, strong winds, turbulence, and that's where most of the damage will, uh, will occur from the winds. By midnight Saturday, September 8th, the worst is over. But Galveston, Texas, is in ruins. The dead are everywhere, as family members search for loved ones under mountains of broken wood. But the storm has not finished its murderous rampage. Leaving Galveston behind, it smashes inland and continues its deadly sweep north toward its final target, the island of Newfoundland. September 11th, 1900. Off the coast of Newfoundland, fishermen from the island and as far away as France prepare for the end of the fishing season in the rich Atlantic waters of the Grand Banks. Captain William Edgecombe and the tiny crew of the Lilydale will soon set sail for the port of Catalina where William's wife, Rosanna, waits expectantly for his return. North of Catalina, in the coastal village of Carmenville, retired fisherman George Carnell watches the skies. His two sons have been fishing the Newfoundland coast for a month now and should be on their way home. He's aware that autumn gales are often the tail end of tropical hurricanes from down south. News of one of those hurricanes has hit all the papers. In Niagara Falls, Ontario, at the local waterworks facility, 47-year-old pump man Edward Carter has been following the storm's progress. Just a few days earlier, it all but wiped out the town of Galveston, Texas, and it's been heading north ever since. When the hurricane left the water, and moved into Texas, it lost its source of energy, but there was still a lot of energy inherent in the storm, so although the, the winds died down a bit, they were still damaging winds, and people were killed in Chicago, and boats were sunk on uh, Lake Michigan. It then turned eastward and headed for Ontario, and it came into a conjunction with another storm, coming from the prairies over the northern Great Lakes. And so it had this extra ingestion of energy from the difference between the warm and the cold uh, air masses. The storm rolls northeast through the Niagara region, where 60 kilometer winds rip through the area's fruit orchards. They were looking forward to a very large crop of high quality apples in the area. Well, you subject those to winds of near hurricane strength, and just a lot of the apples and other fruit were torn off the trees. When it hits Niagara Falls, the storm causes serious problems at the local waterworks facility. Fierce winds and high water drive debris into the flume, a large inclined trough used for draining water. As the only employee on duty, it is up to pump man Edward Carter to clear the debris away. The storm continues northeast, bearing down on Canada's maritime coast. In New Brunswick and further north in Gaspé, there was a lot of damage to the fishing fleets. 
the local newspaper listed 38 Acadian fishermen who'd lost their lives. As it did over the Gulf of Mexico five days earlier, the storm picks up strength as it feeds hungrily off the waters of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. By the time the storm uh, had crossed the strait to Newfoundland, it had gained a lot of strength. The winds had picked up very severely. The newspaper in St. John's has followed the progress of the storm during its northward swing from Galveston. But those on the water are unaware of what is to come. There was really no way to warn people who were out on the ocean. If people weren't in sight of shore and able to see a storm signal, they were essentially not warned about uh, the storms. September 13th, 1900. Remnants of the hurricane that ravaged the city of Galveston, Texas, has swept north into Canada, regaining some of its strength as it pushes across the Gulf of St. Lawrence toward the island of Newfoundland and the men fishing its shores. The howling monster that descends on the French islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon on September 12, 1900, is like nothing the French fleet fishing there has ever seen. The fishing fleet at St. Pierre and Miquelon was decimated by this storm. Nine schooners and 120 men are known to have lost their lives. As the storm continues its savage sweep along the Newfoundland coast, fishing schooners on the Grand Banks are rocked by violent winds and giant waves. On the Lilydale, Captain William Edgecombe and his tiny crew fight for their lives as they try to reach the nearest harbor. And that was their only hope of survival. They would have been accosted by high waves and tremendous wind. In order to survive, to be driven before the wind, they would have been lashed to sails and the wind would have carried them along. I can't imagine it. Wave after wave after wave. And the wind blowing, living gale. Nothing can stand it, nothing. Not even a big ship. It's probably tied to the wheel, I don't know. But that's what they usually used to do when the weather was bad. Maybe it was taking buddies on by son and the one he had on and his wife. The storm engulfs the island as it roars northward, ravaging the rugged coastline with savage winds and killer waves that trap nearby fishing schooners in its wake. Many of them had accumulated in one place because it was the end of the year and they were getting ready to go back home. One of those vessels is the Goodwill, trying to make it home to Carmenville on the northeast coast of Newfoundland. Captain John Carnell his brother and three other crew members can only pray that they will see their wives and children again. Thursday, September 14th, 1900. The storm born weeks before off the coast of Africa finally blows itself out over the North Atlantic. In the city of Galveston, Texas, the number of dead is so great that bodies must be dumped in huge trenches and set afire. It is the worst hurricane in the history of the United States, with over 6,000 Americans confirmed dead, although some estimates are closer to 10,000. Although fatalities in Canada are substantially less, the loss of loved ones is just as difficult to bear. Canada's first fatality is Edward Carter, the man on duty at the local waterworks on September 11th, when the storm hits Niagara Falls. And the feeling is that he lost his footing in trying to keep this debris away and uh, fell into the water, perhaps helped by the, the strong wind. In the port town of Catalina, Newfoundland, Rosanna Edgecombe searches the horizon for signs of her husband's fishing boat the Lilydale. She used to tell me that after he was gone and, uh, and, and after he had the, the big storm, that she would go down in the beach because you could see right out to harbor where he sailed from. And she sits there and wait. 
she probably knew deep down in her soul he wasn't coming back because he was supposed to be home at a certain time and he didn't turn up. William Edgecombe's vessel, the Lilydale, never did come back to port. So it can only be assumed that the vessel capsized or was driven out to sea and all the men were lost. Two weeks after her husband's death, Rosanna Edgecombe gives birth to their second son. My grandfather was drowned the 12th of September, and my father was born at 28. So you can't even imagine what that was like. In the town of Carmenville to the north, retired fisherman George Carnell and his family get similar news after portions of a wreck are discovered off the Newfoundland coast. It was uh, a, a name carved in the handle of a knife and part of the uh, companionway or the housing over the stairs leading below. Enough that they were able to determine this was the goodwill of Carmenville. Captain John Carnell and his brother and three other crew from Carmenville and that general area were, you know, they perished in the storm. They either drowned outright or they died of exposure. It wasn't until October 4th that the local Western Star newspaper had what seems like a full report, and they said that 82 schooners had foundered. Another 100 were, had been seriously damaged by the storm. With the loss of her husband, William, Rosanna Edgecombe, like many Newfoundland widows, must rely on the charity of family and community. She was a very fond, happy person. She never laughed very much. She never, ever wanted anyone belong to her to go to sea, never. She had three sons, and you know the three of them went to sea. So you can imagine what that did to her. She spent her whole life wondering where they were and if they wanted to come back. 